Hello, this is the third topic in synchronization. It's about message passing. This is a short lecture because you will learn message passing in a distributed computing course or distributed algorithm course. So this lecture only provides you with all the basic concepts. So let's start. What is message passing? When processes or threads are interested with one another, two fundamental requirements must be met, synchronization and the communication. Synchronization, as we have seen so far, enforces mutual exclusion. This topic, we talk about communication. Communication allows information to be passed to other processes or threat. Message passing is a form of communication. It can be implemented in shared memory and the distributed environment. So what do these two mean? Let's explain it a little bit further. We have seen mutex lock, semaphores, and the monitors. The locks, the semaphores, and monitors are global entities, so that all threads of processes can have access to it. But not sure you have noticed that all of the processes and the threads are run in the same computer. They store their information or data in the memory of that computer, including the locks and semaphore and the monitors. The only difference is, is these are global entity. This means all processes and threads use a piece of shared memory to store and manage mutex locks, semaphores, and the monitors. <laughs> On the other hand, in a distributed environment, processes and threads are run on different computers without a global shared memory. So in this case, message passing becomes useful. So when we talk about communication, there has to be some links between threats and the processes. When we build these communication links, there are three important issues. First, naming. Second, synchronization. You see the word synchronization again. And third, buffering. Naming means how do we refer to each other? You want to send me an email, you need to know my email address. I want to call you, I need to know your phone number. These are naming. Synchronization means when we participate in the message passing activity, do we have to wait for something? For example, when I want to call you, do I have to wait until you pick up the phone? Or when you expect me to call you, will you always look at your phone waiting for my call? These are synchronizations. Finally, buffering. Can messages wait in a communication link if it's not yet delivered? For example, if you expect the package from your mail service person and your mail service person will put that package into your mailbox. Now, what if you have no mailbox? What would you do? You'll probably just uh, stand somewhere waiting for the mail delivery person to put the package in your hand. It's, it is particularly true if the package requires a signature. So in that case, if you, your mailbox has no memory because it's not there. Now, what if you have a large mailbox, the uh, mail delivery person would just put all of the letters and the package 
into a mailbox. And this is the meaning of buffering. So let's talk about naming. Naming, we have direct addressing. We, you could use a symmetric scheme. Now, for all of this communication, we, ha we have two primitives, at least two primitives, send and receive. For symmetric scheme and direct addressing, we want to send a message to this receiver. When, one, when we want to receive a message, we indicate we need to receive a message from this sender. So here, the message is to be sent for the send method. You have to name a receiver. How do you name a receiver? For email address, you simply put your email address here. And this is your email. Of course, there are so many hidden information. Uh, for an example, what type of the message is, the length of the message, and so on and so forth. Let me uh, skip it here. You will learn it elsewhere. So not only we provide the receiver's name, but also the message. Well, receive is the opposite. Here, you name the sender. I want to receive a message from this sender. And the received message should be here. So with this scheme, exactly one link exists between each pair of communicating processes. When I want to call you, I know your phone number. I call you, put your phone number here, and my message to be sent to you. Suppose you expect me to call you, then you receive my message with my name here. So these links, the link between uh, two parties may be established for processes that need to communicate before they run. Or the co these communication links can be built dynamically uh, if it is necessary. So this is the symmetric scheme. Both you must, the sender specify one receiver. The receiver specify a sender. Now, how about asymmetric? The send method is the same. You want to send a message to someone, you name that one. But for many cases, just like a, a taking phone call as an example, when I want to call you, I put your na name or number here. But normally, you do not name the sender. Instead, you execute receive with the message and the, the one who sent you the message as an argument. So this receive means not only you receive the message, you also receive the name of the sender. For an example, if you, you look at your phone, when it rings, you know the caller, right? So in this case, it is asymmetric because for send, you name the receiver. But for the receive, you receive the sender's name. So in this scheme, a receiver can receive messages from any processes as long as you have communication links with the other parties. This direct addressing naming technique has some disadvantages in both symmetric and asymmetric scheme. Because we need to name the sender or the receiver, changing the name or ID of a process may require examining all other processes definitions. In a system, suppose processes call, send, call, receive each other, then how will you be able to identify a process? The process ID, of course. 
Now, when you want to know the process ID on a different computer, the system would definitely help you to do that. There's no problem. But the problem is if the process name or process ID changed, for an example, you run a process for a purpose to manage something. That process runs on computer A. And process is on computer B, C, or D must communicate this particular process running on computer A. But for some reason, you updated this process. You updated this process, restarted. This process may have a process ID different from the previous one. Then all the send or receive call could be invalid because the sender or receiver ID changed. So you have to maintain a catalog so that this name change could be tracked. So this is a big issue. So another technique to overcome this problem is we cut the, we cut the link so that they do not have to you to know the name of the processes or threat who participate in a message communication activity. So what is this? This indirect addressing, <clears throat> a very commonly seen one is mailbox. Mailbox is just like a, the US Postal Service mailbox. Each mailbox has, it, has an address. And that address is the unique ID of the mailbox. So suppose I want to send you a message. I won't send to your room or your house instead of send to your mailbox. So the send and receive becomes, I want to send a message to this mailbox. When you want to receive a message, you could name I want to get the message from this mailbox. So the mailbox name must be given. Of course, you could have several emails, just use email as an example. You may have several mailboxes from Google, from Meet MTU, from elsewhere, and from iCloud, and so on. So when you want to receive a message, you simply say, I want to receive a message from iCloud or Microsoft or something. And when you want to send a message to say uh, Google Mail, then you put your Google email address here. So this is easy. We are used to it. In this way, we communicate through a mailbox shared by us. In this way, we do not need to know your process ID, even though you kill your process and run again, as long as your new process knows this mailbox name, you can still communicate with the other parties who knows this mailbox. Not only this, mailbox can be shared by multiple processes. So basically, there is a link between two processes only if they share a mailbox. A link may be shared by multiple processes. For an example, you rent an apartment with several uh, classmates. So suppose this apartment has four rooms, you get four bodies there, but that apartment has only one mailbox. So when I want to send you a message, my letter is going to send to thus it a street address. And that mailbox is shared by you four people. So multiple links may exist between each pair of process and each link corresponds to a mailbox as long as we know each other. For an example, 
for school business, you use empty use mailbox. And suppose you own Apple computers that you could have a uh, iCloud email address. And if you use something else, you make some other mailbox. You and I could share all three, as long as we are able to communicate we know your, each other's uh, mailbox name. By decoupling the sender and receiver, indirect addressing provides a greater flexibility in the use of messages. You know it if you have multiple uh, email addresses. Now, there are several types of mailbox. The first one is these two process use a one direction, one to one mailbox. So this mailbox is only shared by two, one to one. What if this one want to come with this one, they could share another mailbox. So for this process, it has outgoing mailbox and the incoming mailbox. For this one, it has a incoming mailbox and outgoing mailbox. This case is rare. This one is mainly to one. This mailbox is shared by a group of outgoing message from this process and uh, one process here. So this is many process could send message to this one and only one process. So in this case, this kind of a mailbox is referred to as a port. This is very commonly seen. Then we have once if we have many to one, of course, we would have one to many. So one process sent message to a mailbox, which is shared by a group of processes. When this group of processes you want to read message, well, there has to be a mechanism to retrieve a message from this mailbox. And finally, this mailbox is shared by two groups, one senders, one receivers. This is referred to many to many. So one to one, many to many, this is referred to as a port. One to many and the many to many. Now, what if there is only one message in a mailbox and several processes execute receive? What would happen? This happened to one to many and many to many. So we have one message in the mailbox, but multiple processes want to retrieve that message. What would happen? If there's only one link between at most two processes, uh, this situation will never happen. That is one to one. So if we have many to many or one to many mailbox, usually we only allow one process to receive a message at a time. That is even though we have multiple processes trying to get that message, some kind of a mutual exclusion must be built into that message system so that only one process could get that message. Or you allow the system to select an arbitrary order just like uh, when you try to lock a lock, mutex lock, only one can go through. Or you could also allow the system to implement whatever order, first in, first out, and so on. So this is a very important issue. We will uh, revisit very soon later. The next topic is synchronization. But here, synchronization is not about new text lock and uh, semaphore. It's about how a send and the receive primitives would react. We have send and the receive. So 
for sin, it could be blocking sin or non blocking sin. For receive, it could be blocking receive or blocking non blocking receive. What does that mean? Blocking sin means the sender blocks until its message is received. Non blocking sin means the sender simply sends the message and resume its execution immediately. Not sure you know the rotary phone in the good old days. Ask your granddad, granddad, they probably know it. So if I want to call you, I dial in the number. And if you are not there, either I hang up or I wait. If I have to wait until you pick up the phone at the other end. This is blocking sin. Today's uh, iPhone or an Android phone, you call if it's not there or you not, uh, or pro probably 10 to 20 years ago, many phone has answering machine. So I call you, if you're not there, your answering machine will pick up my call and ask me to, to say something. In that case, I simply send my message and this is non-blocking send. So depending on when a sender wants to send a message, whether the sender blocks or not. If the sender must block until the message is received, this is it blocking send. If the sender can simply send the message and then resume its execution immediately, this is non-blocking send. Now, from this non-blocking send, you know something important. Just take the uh, uh, answering machine or your voicemail. I call you, I simply leave a message. You know, this is not blocking sin. But where that message is stored, is stored in the communication link. Consider your uh, answering machine and uh, your voicemail is part of a communication link. Then let's talk about receive. Blocking receive means the receiver blocks until a message is available. Now blocking receive means the receiver either receives the message or a null message. Let's reconsider the rotary phone. You had my interview. I, I promise that uh, today's, I, today I will call you around 1 p.m. So you just wait by the phone. I call you maybe a little bit earlier or maybe a little bit later than 1 p.m. I call you because we are using rotary phone and this match is so important. So I use blocking sand. And you may want to know what the interview result is. It's very likely you will be hired. Then you simply wait for that message. You want to receive that message and you wait there until the phone rings, then you hear my message, congratulations, you are hired. So in this case, we have blocking send and the blocking receive. Now, if your, answer, if your phone has an answering machine around 1 p.m., you get an, an emergency call asking you to do something. So you cannot be there, which is okay because you have an answering machine. So you just leave a message there asking me to leave a message. So I call you blocking send until your answering machine tells me to leave a message. I leave the message. Then I hand up your answering machine also hands up. So when you come back, you either get my message 
Or if I forgot to call you, then you get a no, meaning no call. Was made. So this is blocking send and non blocking receive. Now, today, I, we could just use non blocking send and non blocking receive because we all have uh, voicemail or answering machine. So we have blocking send, non blocking send, blocking receive, blocking, non blocking receive. Of this four case, you combination, if both send and receive are blocking, we have a rendezvous between the sender and the receiver. Why rendezvous? We have to meet at both sides of the call. So we have a rendezvous. Blocking send and blocking receive forms a very important communication scheme. We call it rendezvous. And actually some programming languages implement message passing with blocking send, blocking receive in, in this most basic way. The language ADA, we will talk about it in the future. Now, blocking and uh, non-blocking are known as synchronous and asynchronous, not synchronization, synchronous and asynchronous. If the sender and receiver must synchronize their activity, use synchronous communication. For an example, if I want to talk to you directly, we use blocking send, blocking receive so that we have a rendezvous. If that is needed, occasionally it's probably needed. You want, suppose we have two processes, A and B. A may want to know when B reaches certain steps. And B must also know when A has reached a step or not. Now, because of the uncertainty, of the order of event, asynchronous communication is more difficult to program. Why we call uncertainty in the order of event? With a, if sender and the receiver are synchronized, we know each other that we are both at some places. If we use not all non-blocking or even one blocking, the other non-blocking, Usually we don't know where the other party is. So the program that use asynchronous communication is usually more difficult to write. However, asynchronous algorithms are general and affordable because we don't need to know where each other is. If your asynchronous algorithm is proved correct, then they are guaranteed to run correctly on network with arbitrary time timing behavior. So this is very important topics in distributed computing. Uh, you should learn it in a distributed computing course. The next topic is capacity. The capacity of link is buffer size. Hmm. What does that mean by buffer size? Remember, your answering machine or your voicemail can be considered as part of a communication link. You need to store message in the uh, uh, voicemail or your uh, answering machine. Neither your answering machine nor your voicemail can store infinite number of messages. Therefore, you could consider your answering machine or your voicemail as a buffer to store the messages. The capacity of a link is this buffer size. 
we have three type of buffer size. The first one is zero capacity. That is communication link has no buffer. This implies that you cannot store a message on the communication link. As a result, this is a synchronous link. As a result, sender blocks because the sender must block due to the message cannot be delivered without the other party there. Whether the other party is there, that's another issue. The second one is another extreme, unbounded capacity. Message can be stored there and there's no limits. So sender never blocks and the link, and the link is asynchronous. The order of message being received does not have to be pristine or stuck because a communication or even a mailbox may receive so many messages from so many uh, processes. And there's no way to know who, who was sent first. So timing is a very important issue in distributed computing. A message sent based on its local time earlier than another message sent also based on its different uh, local time. The order may not be completely well ordered. So remember the order of message being received, even though we have unbounded capacity, it does not have to be first in, first out. Then bounded capacity. It's generally the daily life answering machine and voicemail. Message can be buffered. It's buffered message passing. Sender blocks if the buffer is full and the link is asynchronous. That means send, when the sender wants to send a message and uh, the, ma the capacity of link is full, either you drop out or you wait until the buffer is not full. Isn't it a, this bounded buffer if the order is first seen, first out? Please check back what the bounded buffer problem is. So you see one example. The or, if the order is first in, first out, it means it's going to be a shared memory implementation. So you can easily simulate a bounded capacity communication link simply by rewriting the bounded buffer program. You change put to send. You change get to receive. And uh, the mes message has at least two components. Who is the sender? And the second is the message itself. Of course, in a distributed computing environment, this is not so easy. So, you, throughout the semester, we, for process programming, we use message passing, uh, we use Linux, which is variant of Unix. And Tremendor is implemented on Linux. So can Unix or Linux do message passing? And how about Tremendor? Yes. Unix is all Unix system provided at least two message passing mechanisms, pipes and uh, message keys. Remember this A, vertical bar, B mechanism. A's STD, STD out is connected to B's STD in. So we could consider A is the center. It always centers as 
uh, print out std out message to b and b is the receiver so this is the uh, earlier uh, unix version in later unix version this pi mechanism was generated to be used between processes rather than just very restrictive to std out and std in there is a system called pi it takes an argument of two integers. This argument is referred to PFD. That's pipe file descriptor. I know you know how to use file system. File system will return to a file descriptor. File descriptor. So Unix treat pipe, it's just a uh, file. So when you call pipe, it would return two elements in PDF0 and a PDF, a PFD1. PFD0 is equivalent to STD in, PFD1 is equivalent to STD out. So if you want to send a message, to another processes that you send it to your PD, PFD zero. And when you want to receive a message from another process, that process will simply get the data from you. You get the data from F, PFD zero. Of course, the other processes will send its message to your PFD zero and retrieve the message you sent to it from PFD1. So this is a very simple mechanism, very handy. But a more powerful mechanism in Unix is message queues. Remember when we talk about share memory, we use share memory get to obtain a piece, a segment of shared memory, and the shared memory attached to attach that piece of shared memory into my address space. And then after that, I could use it. Then if I don't want to use it, then I execute a shared memory detach. And if you are the owner, after using the shared memory, you use shared memory control to kill the whole shared memory. So message queues in Unix are mailboxes. Use message get to get a message, uh, to get a mailbox. You still supply a key. Then after you obtain a message get, you could send message to that mailbox by message SND, and you execute an MSGRCV, message to receive, to receive messages. However, each message has a rather complex data structure. For an example, you need to specify the type of a message. Some people use that type to indicate which processes could receive it and so on. So this is the end of our very, very basic message passing. The next two lectures are also short. The next one is how can we do message passing with Thremander? And then the third one is a demo. So let me stop here. Goodbye and uh, good luck.